Um, and I'm serious. You can actually double check that. Um, yeah. Anyway, why did the content providers buy into this? Well, because Apple made a cryptographic construct that allowed them to protect within a reasonable amount the security of their content. So they said, you know what, for a buck, that's pretty good, because we're just going to give it to you once. I don't need to press CDs. I don't need to do anything else. You take care of all the distribution. We make money. Check. Got it. Um, in, what was it, uh, March 7, 2 billion songs downloaded from the iTunes Music Store. I would call 2 billion of anything, except maybe like oxygen molecules or anything else you'd measure in moles, um, <laughs> to be pretty damn impressive. So through transitivity, Apple made DRM cool. Okay? DRM, if you go research DRM, digital rights management, all the stuff that controls the content, all it is is grumble, grumble, bitch about, my God, this is just the man controlling my machine and whatever. Oh, but my iPod. <laughs> no one, I mean, people don't think about it. People are just happy as a stuffed pig they can download this stuff. So what does that have to do with, with trusted hardware? Well, um, Apple pretty much made trusted hardware cool, too. This is something really neat that they did. Um, the idea is they went to the Intel processor. Neat study was done a couple years ago regarding how the mock microkernel executes on G4 PowerPC processors and G5 PowerPC processors versus Intel processors. And everybody who's a Mac used to have this big, well, the IBM PowerPC platform is so much better than the Intel platform. And I was one of them. Like, I swore up and down, oh, these PowerPCs kicked the crap out of Intel. And some guy did a study, and it says, you know what? It turns out the way the mock microkernel executes, the PowerPC is potentially the worst architecture you could choose to execute that particular operating system on. And we all went, ha, and it's still faster, so we're still better. You know, we just, again, <laughs> changed the rules of the game. Um, but Apple eventually ran out of, you know, uh, um, faith with I sold all their intellectual capital for, you know, peanuts or whatever. And, and they decided to invest um, their time and efforts into moving to an Intel platform. And Apple was really worried they're going to move to Intel, and then everybody is going to go buy a Dell and load OS X, okay? Because there's some, I don't know. I, they feel that OS X is like the neatest thing ever, and everyone wants to run it, so they'll buy cheap hardware, and it'll all work out. And they said, well, how can we stop this from happening? How can we keep this core piece of our, you know, the way we operate, if and only if Apple hardware software, then do the cool and easy stuff. And if you lose one of those two things, you know, what can we do? So one thing that they had done is they had purchased some, um, a product that they ultimately adapted called Rosetta, which does on-the-fly translation from PowerPC opcodes to x86 opcodes. Neat for the CS geeks in the world, I'll repeat, neat on-the-fly emulation of another. This is what I'm running here, Microsoft PowerPoint, compiled for PowerPC running on a dual-core Intel box faster than it platform. Wow. <laughs> Sexy. Um, they called it Rosetta, and what Rosetta did when it started was verify that there was a TPM, a trusted platform module, this little cryptographic device, basically a smart card on a chip soldered onto the motherboard. It would say, hey, are you there? And TPM would be like, yep, let me check you out. And check its heart rate, bend over, and everything was okay. <laughs> it would move on, and it would start. Well, clearly, this is a software process, right? Like, we haven't gone through all the trusted boot and everything, so I can still inject something to say, oh, everything's okay, and get it to continue on. Same thing with the iPod, right? Like, you can un-DRM your music that you buy from iTunes Music Store. How many people do? Handful. How many people do on a regular basis? It's actually a lot more than you see in the general public. In the general public, that number is probably one out of a thousand, one out of ten thousand, one out of a hundred thousand. We try never to do, right? <laughs> Al just makes his own music and listens to it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a lot of the Kirk feet match. He just <laughs> chanted it in his head, dun, 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 dun. Um, <laughs> so Apple ensures, you know, through this way that their proprietary software only runs on their hardware. This guy, Maxis, he unleashed the power of the Apple lawyer, and the Apple lawyer came after him, and he then, you know, kind of went underground and popped up all the stuff in a different website, and went underground and popped up in a different website. If you search for Maxis now, all you find are a bunch of forums that say, hey, I can't find this code anymore. And then a couple weeks later, oh, I and then a day later, oh, I can't find his code anymore. Um, eventually, Apple realized no one cares about OS X enough to go buy this. So to save a buck fifty in the fabrication process, they took the chip back off. But you know what? In the time they did that, they sold a couple million of these critters to some of the most cynical people on the planet, security professionals, right? You go to a security conference, half the people there are using these things. Like, we defy all the standard, like, you know, distribution of who should own these. Like, we own a lot of them. And cool, no one 
thought twice. All right? DRM, or excuse me, the TPM chips are starting to be deployed in all kinds of systems. They have an incredible impact on how we deal with information security. Okay? The problem is we don't have any freaking way to make the right thing happen um, from a security perspective. We don't have the building blocks in place to leverage this. So the concern with TPMs right now is that, oh man, the man's going to control my computer, man. I don't know what to do, man. He's going to tell me everything. That, the man, man. You know, that's, that's my hippie imitation, by the way. I'm a little... <laughs> Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm at the hippie tattoo. Um, so th the, the problem is we don't have those core building blocks. So while we're all wrapped around the axle about worrying what other people are going to do, we need to actually be worried about what do we need to do as a community to leverage these trusted platform modules, okay? Dell, IBM, Toshiba are also starting to integrate these capabilities into their laptops and their desktops, okay? Within the next technology refresh cycle, about three years, we're going to go from the majority of systems don't have them to the majority of systems do have them, okay? We've got a chicken and egg problem. No one's going to write software that leverages the trusted platform module until the majority of systems have a trusted platform module in them. Conversely, people aren't going to integrate the trusted platform module until the software exists. Well, it turns out the manufacturers think the need is there now. They're integrating it. So now we need to write software. We need to write better firewalls, better security stuff, better operating systems that leverage the TPM before the man gets it. Um, I, got a, I really got a haul butt because I only got about three minutes left. Um, <laughs> Good Lord. So my PowerPoint, uh, um, uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> patches have two major uses, right? They make your system more secure and they make them more insecure, okay? As soon as a patch is released, the attackers can instantly start trying to weaponize it. They figure out where's the vulnerability, how can I exploit it, how can I release it in the wild. They can do that in hours, let's say six. You know, there's been people who've been like, Microsoft Patch Tuesday, ooh, six hours later, and, I had, you know, half a fifth of rum, boom. I'm unconscious, drunk, but there's a weaponized exploit. Rock! You know, I'm, I'm leet. Most organizations, when they go to deploy the patch, they have to regression test the patch. They have to clear out their QA environment, drop in the patch, test everything, figure out how they're going to deploy it, then actually push it into the enterprise, and then deal with the 150 one-offs that they couldn't comprehend that they had to deal with before, right? I work with some organizations where you say, they're like, oh, man, we got so much better at deploying these patches now that Patch Tuesday's here and we can plan for it. I say, really, how long does it take? And they say, oh, you know, about two, and I expect the next word to be weeks, and they're like, months. But sometimes it's up to four months still. <laughs> okay, so, so th th we'll go with really big window here, okay? Really big window. And it turns out when people have things like Metasploit, God bless it, but tools like Metasploit make it so I can take a weaponized exploit and launch it on things really quickly. Cool. And no one can defend against it, right? Like, if your firewall has a problem, or I'm already in the back because one of your users gave me the password, as soon as one of these things gets taken care of, you know, the exploit's released, it's boom, and I own your entire enterprise. Oops, you never saw it. Oh, unless you're paying the IPS people who had the O-Day information ahead of time because they bought it from the researcher in the first place. Oh, uh, <laughs> hmm, bit of a... <laughs> Chin scratcher there. Um, secret number five, um, operational security. I have an entire presentation on this. Microsoft may be your best bet. I hate Linux. There, I've said it. Um, yeah. You, you can't actually have any clue what you're going to do tomorrow when you're using Linux, OK? Was anyone surprised when Microsoft released Vista? OK, it was delayed a bit, and ha, 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 there's some jokes around that. But you know what? CDN was loaded with information. They had people in the VAR pipeline. They had people in the big enterprises telling them, this is Vista. This is what it can do. Here's 2 million people beta testing it. It's fantastic. Everybody knew. Who knows when the next kernel is coming out and what's going to be in it? <laughs> right. Linus doesn't know. Okay? He'll decide tomorrow, I had an omelet, and that means it's kernel day. And like, <laughs> he's going to go and release a kernel. That's not a way to maintain an operating system because then all the people that have to take that and turn it into a distribution have to deal with 100 people like Linus who are writing the PCM CIA drivers and the frickin', God bless them, the hot plug driver people, I'd like to strangle with both my hands. They change hot plug every six months because they can't stop pissing on each other. And it drives me crazy. Okay, so Red Hat and everybody just wrapped some duct tape around it. There was a, there was a study where um, they, they looked at all the 
to Ubuntu, integrated into Ubuntu. They said, how much code did you change in the way in? They said, we changed 56% of the packages that we imported into this operating system. <laughs> Holy cow. So DHS funded a big thing from, not Fortify, but some software security company who looked at a bunch of open source software packages for security vulnerabilities. Great work. Fantastic work. Say what you will about it. People disparage it for various reasons. But when someone like Ubuntu takes it and integrates it in, what does that mean to the previous security work I've done in that package? I guess I'll reanalyze the source code. That sounds cheap. Um, <laughs> one last thing, and I'm going to end on this. There's other secrets, but they're not important. I really don't want to step on the next speaker's toes. Um, Microsoft, in the early stages of Vista, in the 64-bit version, they said, guess what? We're going to go back to this thing on the previous slide, and we're going to say, we're only going to load signed drivers. We're only going to load the drivers we want to load, OK? Wow. I, I was excited. I was like, this is a step forward. This is honest to God security in the operating system. Semantica McAfee and that whole crew came forward and said, but you know, it turns out when you do that, we actually can't do what we normally do to intercept all the stuff inside the kernel and everything to you know, figure out what's going on to make your box more secure. So uh, we would appreciate it if you didn't. And you didn't pay any attention to the drivers you loaded. And you loaded them willy-nilly like you always have in the past. So you had these big security vulnerabilities so that we can find them and make them more secure. And Microsoft said, what? <laughs> And then they said, oh, check this out. We're going to go to the EU, and we're going to say, antitrust, antitrust. And then we're going to have your ass in the sling. And Microsoft said, shit. And <laughs> they opened it up. They got rid of it. They said, OK, you can just go, turn the thing, and that's it. No more driver signing needed in 64-bit Windows. So the moral of the story is, for years, we've been having this t premise that said, I can't write secure code. Therefore, I need a bunch of third-party security applications to make the operating system more secure. Now, it's fundamentally changed. Microsoft's core statement is, you know what? We spend more money on security than some third-world countries spend on food, OK? We know how to do security at least reasonably well and start trusting us. Third-party products say, oh, but you know what? We got billions of dollars of market share, and you're this big, massive corporation. And no, you can't, because of antitrust. So security decisions are being made on our behalf under the guise of keeping a competitive market space. Okay? The market will take care of you. The market will take care of you. Yes, all the anarchists and libertarians, we will unite. The market will take care of us. Anyway, I appreciate it. It's 7 o'clock, so I need to get off the stage. Thank you very much. Yeah.